G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. So, as you know, recently Australia played Sri Lanka in that two test series. Basically, it was the exact opposite of how the Australia India series went. Australia absolutely clobbered Sri Lanka. I know that doesn't really seem like a surprise, but I think after the India series, everyone was a little bit worried about the Australian test team, and some people thought it was actually going to be a really close series. Personally, I've never really understood why Sri Lanka are such a good one-day team and when it comes to test cricket, they just shit the bed. In fact, could be wrong, but I don't think they've actually ever beaten Australia in a test match. So, the series pretty much followed the historical trend and the Aussies clobbered them. What can we really take out of the series? On the plus side, we did actually get to expose some good young talent. Guys like Jai Richardson, Curtis Patterson get opportunities they might not otherwise have. Jai Richardson in particular has had a ridiculous summer. He took an 8 for and a 5 for in his Sheffield Shield leading up to this series. Has an awesome start to his one-day series, taking a man of the match performance, and then comes straight into the test side and looks like he belongs straight away. That's a huge plus for us because I think it's good for guys like Stark, Hazelwood in particular to have some accountability now that we've got someone who's ready to come in straight away and can perform. We've also given an opportunity to someone like Curtis Patterson, which is awesome to see. I can't remember the last time some young gun has come into the Australian team and made runs straight away in the test side. I remember when Patterson debuted for New South Wales, I think he hit 157 not out in his first innings and everyone was saying this kid is the absolute next big thing. Of course, as so happens in cricket, he spent the next few years doing not much and then has seems to have come good now. As I said in the video, I think he faced 622 deliveries against Sri Lanka in the last few first class matches and has only been dismissed once. The guy is an absolute run machine at the moment, which is a great thing for Australian cricket. We haven't had that in a while. It's also nice to see someone like Joe Burns come back into the side and hit a big hundred. And of course, Travis Head gets reward for effort after a big summer. He's had a lot of starts, but against someone like Sri Lanka, he was able to really put the foot down. And that's something I think the Australian team lacked all summer, the ability to really kick on after making a good start. Overall, I think it was a good series for the Australians to get some confidence because you could tell from the start of the Australia-India series to the end, the Australian team's confidence was completely sapped. They were a much better team at the start of that series and at the end, they were lucky to they were lucky to lose 2-1. It's a nice reward for someone like Tim Payne to get his first series win as captain. As I said in my other video, I think he's actually done a pretty good job as captain considering he was very much a stand-in skipper. Of course, a lot of you would have seen that I uploaded my Ashes Squad video yesterday. I am the king of timing when it comes to uploading these videos. With my AFL predictions video, I referenced Tom Mitchell the day after he broke his leg because of course I edit the video and then there's about a 12 hour delay before I upload it. This time, I drop Stark and Kawaja for my Ashes series and the next day, Stark completes a 10 wicket haul and Kawaja hits a century, so I'm not having much luck here. Is it enough for me to change my mind? Possibly not. With Stark in particular, I think he's bowled fairly poorly this summer. Maybe I'm being harsh, and I have to admit, I just don't really like watching the guy bowl. You know, Stark and Kawaja had the whole summer to perform, and the fact that they waited until the last test to sort of flat track in a pretty much a dead rubber, it holds a little less weight for me. I mean, maybe I'm being harsh there. As I said, they're both good enough to be in that Ashes starting 11, it's just that they were both kind of horribly out of form, so I dropped them for that. But what I will say is that this is a mammoth winter of cricket coming up. It's going to be very difficult as a footy fan to focus on both footy and the fact that we got a Cricket World Cup and the 2019 Ashes series. What I really like about Australia's approach to this Ashes series is that they've just announced an eight game Australia A tour of the UK next year, right before the Ashes, including an Australia and an Australia A tour game that's gonna go for four days. In addition to this, I believe they're playing the second half of the Shield season with Duke Cricket Balls. For some reason, the Duke Cricket Balls always been a problem for the Australians. Literally, since I've been following cricket, which was 2002 I started following cricket, we've never won a series in England. So if we do pull it off, I will be absolutely stoked. Of course, the World Cup being right before the Ashes is going to be a huge burden on both teams, not just Australia, obviously England as well. It's not ideal preparation. Of course, you've got someone like Cummins, even Hazelwood and Stark, all of those bowlers will probably be the first choice bowlers in the World Cup squad as well. So that is a very long winter for them. The World Cup squad is only 15 men, so they're going to only be able to have one or two reserve bowlers. But as I said, I'm really looking forward to it. I really get around the both the World Cup and the Ashes. That being said, when footy season starts, I have no idea how I'm going to feel. It's going to be very conflicting. In other news, AFLX is starting to gain momentum. Unsurprisingly, most of the reaction around it has been very negative. That is a very Australian way of reacting to something the AFL does. 
It does feel like footy fans in general, their first reaction to whenever the AFL does something is to rubbish it. There is so much negativity about this AFLX competition and personally, I think it's pretty unwarranted. Yes, it does have that real marketing stank all over it. Obviously, the AFL is trying to expand into new markets. A lot of people talk about AFLX like they're trying to expand into international markets, but really it's about getting kids interested in the game because I'm sure they're worried about losing them to other sports like cricket and soccer. So they're trying to make the sport more engaging. Personally, I don't think AFLX as a game is a good product. That being said, what AFLX does give us is a very unique opportunity to see all these elite players playing the same team at the same time. This sort of thing is literally the only opportunity we'll get to see guys like Fife and Bontempelli play on the same team. Like, this could be seriously cool. Obviously, they've made tweaks to the rules, and I think that's good. Last year, the game was a bit too uncontested for me. It wasn't very exciting. It was very kick, run, mark, kick, run, mark. For me, the contested part of our sport is probably the best element. So when you take that out, it's not as good. Interestingly, they've added an extra man on the field now, so it's gonna be eight aside rather than seven. Whether this fixes this issue of too much space, possibly. There's no doubt the rules are getting more complicated. I watched the video explaining the new rules and I barely followed it. It'll probably be one of those things we have to wait and see in action before we can judge it. I guess the other thing that puts people off AFLX is the marketing of it. I said this before about the Big Bash. I think if, I think if Cricket Australia knew how successful the Big Bash was gonna be, I just wonder if they'd put more thought into the branding of the teams. I know the IPL is probably far worse, but I mean, a team like the Sydney Sixers, seriously, it's not very cool at all, is it? And yeah, what are the teams in this AFLS comp? Deadly, Flyers, Bolters, Jump, it's, uh, it's not bad. <laughs> that and the whole superhero vibe because of the Marvel connection, I know it's for kids, but I just think it's a little weird. So I think that's where they're losing a lot of the 18 to 25 year olds who think the marketing of it is so dorky. Personally, I honestly think that people will be so footy starved by the time AFLX comes around that they're going to eat it up. The other AFL product that's getting a lot of hate right now is AFLW. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm getting sick of all the negativity, to be honest. You see so many people trying to point score and be heroes by pointing out the fact that the quality is shit. People watch tennis, people watch fishing, people watch golf. All those things are fun to play, but to watch, oh my god. The thing is, AFLW is literally in its second season. This is the first generation of players to play elite level football. The AFL is doing everything it can to give it a push, and you know what? It's fine, it's in the preseason. It's not like you, they're playing it over men's football, which of course is my preference to watch, but I don't know, why, why are you hating? The thing is as well, if you pay any attention to it, you can see how much it means to those female players. I think a lot of people forget that women can love football as much as men. So female players now actually have an AFL for them to aspire to. For a lot of these AFLW players, it is literally a dream come true. And you can see that in their draft videos. When they get drafted to a team, they literally burst into tears. Like at the risk of getting on my soapbox too much, but you just gotta have the attitude of if it makes people happy and it doesn't affect you, shut the fuck up. And honestly, like, this is the second season. Imagine what the VFL was like in 1898. All of these AFLW players still have day jobs. They don't have the facilities or the training programs that the men's teams do. I'm not saying it will ever be as good as AFL men's. To be honest, there are some facts you can't get past. Women can't run as fast as men. They're not as strong, that is true, but it doesn't mean that the league can't be a very good standard. I'm pretty confident in saying that the second and third generation of AFLW players will be far better. When nine or 10 year old girls can actually join a team and go through the development pathways that actually get them to the elite level. Look, I'm literally the furthest thing from a social justice warrior, but I do hate when people just hate for no reason. But anyway, enough of that. There is one more thing that I want to talk about which we haven't ever discussed on the True Footy channel and that's the English Premier League. We've made almost no mention of it on the channel but we're actually all fairly decent Premier League followers. I, myself, and Joycey, we're both big Liverpool fans and this title race is the best one since maybe the Leicester Arsenal Tottenham one a few years ago. As I record this, Liverpool last night drew to West Ham and we're probably lucky to even get that point so I am very frustrated. It does feel like Liverpool are a bit fragile at the moment and they're a little a bit scared to lose and therefore they're not playing with the same confidence that got them to top spot. They're three points ahead of Man City. I can't help but feel that Man City will probably get over the top and win in the end. But at the same time, it's not like Man City are playing that well either. They just lost to Newcastle. 
And of course, you've got the Dark Horse Tottenham there sitting on 57 points and they could still win. So this is a pretty awesome chase. I don't know what other Liverpool fans would say, but personally, I care way more if, about winning the Premier League than the Champions League. There's still a lot of football to be played left, 13 games, and then you've still got tournaments as well. The thing is, both Man City and Liverpool can be such dominant teams on their day, and I really hope we get a really close finish to the league, as long as Liverpool wins. If you're watching this and you're a Premier League fan, feel free to comment below who you support and who you think will win the Premier League. And no anti-Liverpool comments. There is such a thing in the Premier League to hate rival teams and like, whatever, I get it, it's fine. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for watching guys. Trying a little bit of a new format with these videos and hopefully do a weekly show for you guys during the football season once it starts up. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you are new to the channel, please consider subscribing. We have podcasts, highlights videos, analysis videos, and hopefully more shows like this. Thanks for watching guys. See you later.